So our next speaker is going to be Lars Wisenius, who is going to be talking to us about swimming. Not in the sea or in a river, but swimming upstream. Thank you. Hi. So yeah, um, I was a Debian developer for several years, or more years than I remember. And I have been told during this Deb course that I actually joined in 95, not in 96, as I thought. But last year, about a year ago, uh, a little over a year ago, I decided that I've been doing distribution development for long enough, and I wanted to do something else. And this is the story of what happened next. I decided that I want to become an upstream developer instead of a uh, Debian developer. I retired from, from uh, Debian and, and uh, sought out to conquer new worlds. In uh, the intervening almost one year, I have uh, mostly worked on, on projects of my own. But this talk is actually about something that I did for a, a company in New Zealand called Catalyst IT and uh, a project, free software project called Koha. I don't need to tell you about Debian. You know what Debian is. The slide is here just in case I ever need to give this talk again to another audience who doesn't know about Debian. Koha is an integrated library management system. Uh, library in this context means the kind that has books and CDs and movies in it, not the kind that has shared code. Uh, this, is a, this is an important distinction for some audiences. Uh, it's free software. It's about 10 years old by now, so it started uh, 99 or 2000, originally in uh, New Zealand, and uh, it's uh, used over the uh, over uh, uh, using a browser over the net, and that's a, a sample uh, screenshot. The resolution turns out to be worse than I thought. I apologize for that. How many of you have used the application ever? Okay, I'm just checking that the microphone works. <laughs> So uh, the Koha project and Catalyst IT wanted to have Debian packages made out of Koha. The reason for this is that most of the people involved in Koha really like Debian as a platform on which to run Koha for various social and technical reasons, and I think have to think that's a good choice. However, they did not have any Debian packages. And that meant that even though maintaining everything else about the server was nice and easy and, and comfortable and, and efficient, installing Koha, upgrading Koha, making sure everything works was more work than it should have been. So all the people installing Koha would, would install Koha from sources. And it wasn't just Koha, it was also its dependencies. Koha. Uh, it's written in Perl. It uses dozens of different CPAN modules. Might be hundreds, I haven't actually counted. And quite a large number of those modules are not in Lenny. And some of those which are in Lenny are too old in Lenny, so they want something newer. And uh, therefore, uh, one of the first things I needed to do was package all the missing dependencies. I took a list of the missing dependencies and decided that I don't want to package about 50 packages. I will instead target squeeze, because squeeze release is imminent. This was in uh, March, and I haven't regretted the decision. Squeeze had five missing CPAN modules, and I have packages of those, and, and I'll say a bit more about those. Uh, from a more general po point of view, I don't want to uh, say that Koha is the only upstream that Debian needs to care about. I'm using Koha as an example upstream of, to bring up some problems. 
problems I want to note. One of them, th these problems, is that upstreams want to use lots of new tools and lots of tools that might not exist in Debian. And the reason upstream wants to do this is not to make life difficult for Debian, but to make life easier for themselves. Uh, if Koha can go and pick any CPAN module that exists, it might save them uh, days or weeks or even months of work. However, if there is a case where the CPAN module doesn't exist in Debian, then life becomes, again, complicated in a different way. So upstream has this urge to use new stuff, whereas Debian would like upstream to stick to things that are in Debian in the current stable release. And this uh, conflict is something that it would be good to deal with in some way. Most upstream projects don't have a retired Debian developer or an active Debian developer who can do the packaging for them. So perhaps something can be done about that. So I decided to make uh, modules of the missing CPAN, uh, sorry, packages of the most, uh, missing uh, CPAN modules. And it turns out that CPAN modules are very easy to package. You run dhmakepearl and you edit all the files it creates, which, if you know, packaging is quite easy. The Koha project had tried to do this uh, for an earlier version of Debian and hadn't quite succeeded. They didn't have someone who was good at packaging. So there's a lot of details you have to get right. I didn't get them right either. I did, however, know that there's a packaging team for Perl modules in Debian. So I talked to them, and they were extremely helpful. And especially Gregor Herriman was really helpful. I don't know if he's there. Give him an applause. <laughs> and uh, not just him, but the entire team are, are helpful, and it was... Uh, very important for the quality of the packages I made that, that uh, I, I was able to get them reviewed and, and fix things that would have been a problem otherwise. Then also the Perl module team has people who upload sponsored packages for other people and that makes things smoother as well. So, kudos for Debian. Okay, so I got the CPAN modules created. And then I was able to run the Koha test suite. Koha is one of those upstreams that actually has a test suite. Not all upstreams do. Uh, one of the things that Debian possibly should encourage upstream to do is to provide test suites. And they don't have to be 100% complete in order to be really useful. Koha has a test suite that has about 13% coverage. But that's enough to make sure that most of the basic stuff at least works before you try to do an installation. The next step for me when packaging Koha was to try to do an actual installation of, of Koha into, the, uh, into, into a package and then, then figure out if, if something is missing at runtime. And given that Koha is a web application, it basically needs to talk to the web server and a database server. And I had last dealt with these kinds of things 10 years ago. No, sorry, 14 years ago. And I was having nightmares beforehand. Web servers in 1996 weren't the kinds of web servers that exist now. And the thing that really saved my day was the fact that Debian has a policy and especially the sub-policies for web applications and uh, database applications. And these made things massively simpler. I had expected to be spending a month getting this fixed. It took an afternoon. And it wasn't just the policies, it was also the tools. So dbconfig common and dh especially, and uh, uh, some of the web uh, server stuff helped a lot. You can all, I don't know if Stephen Frost is here, but, but Joe is here. Give him an applause for DH7. <laughs> this stuff, the policy stuff in Debian, uh, is something that we are, as Debian developers, are familiar with. 
but if you haven't experienced what happens to, to people outside of Debian when they try to do something related to packaging and hear about it, this the first time, it totally blows their mind. It's not something that most big projects have. They have an oral tradition, usually maintained by people who left the project five years ago. <laughs> Some projects have an ex excellent written documentation in the form of mailing lists and IRC logs that are archived in a public place. And that's massively better than nothing, but it doesn't, it's not as efficient as, ha as having a policy document. So kudos for Debian for that. Cats happen somewhere. Uh, everything that happened during this packaging process didn't go quite so smoothly. One of the things that Koha upstream had decided was that the uh, Koha system has two interfaces, a public interface for library customers and uh, the public all can use. It can even be used without logging in and you can create a login and, and, and do some personalized stuff there is, if you wish. And then there is a staff interface. And the staff interface is uh, used for things like adding books to the library or telling uh, or marking uh, people so that this person doesn't need to pay the $5,000 fine after not returning the book for 15 years or whatever. However, this duality made it harder to make a package that works out of the box. So it's easy to make something that works uh, on local host, but there needed to be two different sites because the Koha hard, uh, upstream had decided that there needs to be two different URLs for these things. So I had to use a different port for localhost in order to make it work out of the box when installed. This is an upstream decision that makes sense to upstream. But since upstream hasn't ever participated in distribution development, they have no idea that Debian will have a hard time from, of, of doing it. So now that I've informed upstream that this is a problem, they're thinking about fixing it and uh, hopefully will we'll fairly soon. Although my slide says stupid decision, that's a highly opinionated word, it's not that the decision as, said, as such is stupid. Upstream had reasonably good reasons why, why making this decision was good for them. And it works quite fine for them. If you're installing from source, then the person installing it is going to have to be editing with config files all the time anyway, so it's just one more thing to do. However, one of the goals of making a Debian package is to make sure that everything works out of the box without having any configuration, preferably, done by hand. And if you have to do some configuration, it should be minimal. So these kinds of things are easy for an upstream to decide wrong from a Debian point of view. So therefore, Debian should talk to upstreams and educate them so that all of these things eventually go away. The next thing that was a problem was the fact that upstream provides sample templates for config files or sample config files. These never work out of the box. Upstream doesn't want to make decisions that you will be using this version of Apache or that database engine and so on. And so you have to go in and and you're installing from source, you have to go in and review every line of the config files, and there were, I think, half a dozen config files up to hundreds of lines long. So that's a bit of a work. The thing I wanted to do was to make sure that you can install multiple instances of Koha, or have Koha running for multiple different libraries on the same host. The company that was funding this work wanted to do exactly this. They wanted to provide Koha as a service, so that they have one server running this for, for as many users as necessary. And therefore, I need to do some extra mucking about with the config files. So after, uh, I think, four days of, of butchery, uh, tweaking the config files, the, I had something that, that uh, I could write a uh, wrapper around so that I 
uh, run one command to create a new library instance, and it then copies all the files in the right places and fills in some, some values that are missing, and then it works. The problem with this turns out to be that I had to take all of, this, all of these things that upstream provides and throw them away. And this works as long as upstream doesn't change any of their things. And as soon as upstream does, then this needs to be reflected in the package, uh, packaging specific files that I made. And yeah, fair enough, that's what, what needs to be happening, but it would be ideal if one wouldn't have to do this. So, uh, again, pretending to be a conscientious Debian developer, I talked to upstream and, and they agreed that, hey, this system I've, I've developed is actually much better. Also had massively less duplication of config files. And uh, they're going to be adopting that upstream as well, so that's a good thing. The more generic point here is that configuring things on a Linux or, or Unix system is a bit of a mess. Uh, Koha has its own config files. It needs to generate some config for Apache and MySQL uh, and a search engine called Zebra and there was one or two other things. Each of these has a different config file syntax. Some of them have two different config file syntaxes. Life would be massively easier if there was a very small number of, of syntaxes for config files. If anyone disagrees with this point, then please raise their hand and I will happily discuss this point. <laughs> Most of the time the config file syntax differences are pointless. And I suspect the reason is that every, in the larval, larval stage, every hacker needs to write a text editor, an IRC client, a config file parser, and, and a couple of other things. And that's good. They should just stop using them. <laughs> I should stop using mine as well. One of the things that at least most of the Debian project has learned is that uh, having an application that reads a single config file is going to lead to problems. For example, uh, Apache used to have one single config file that it read, which meant that if you want to have another package or an automated tool add to that configuration, like for example adding a, thing, a new uh, virtual host for Apache, they would have to go and edit that config file automatically. Anyone who's tried to make sure that this always works, especially given config file syntaxes that are slightly weird and keep changing, I'm not referring to Apache here, there are other examples, has learned that this is an extremely error prone thing. A massively better way of doing this is to make sure that the, the, the application can be pointed at a directory, usually named something.d, and can read all the files in there in some systematic order and pretend that they're all, all one file. A .d directory allows uh, another program or another package just drop one file in a directory and then it works. And this is very easy to do. Another thing that fairly few applications support is what I like to call stacked config files. So that you can have one in uh, USR share, one uh, in etc whatever, one in the user's home directory. And the good thing about this is that you can have uh, the, file, uh, the config file in USR share is something that nobody needs to uh, ever change and it can have any amount of embedded documentation that you wish. If you put the file and the documentation in etc, it's going to be a config file. And every time it changes, the sysadmin is going to see a nice little depackage prompt saying, oh, something changed. Would you like to see a diff you can't understand? UCF helps a lot with this, but it's not infallible. So talking upstreams into supporting same config file syntaxes uh, .d directories and stacked config files would make things simpler. If you can pick any two of these, life is still simpler. 
Okay, so I made made some packages. Apart from the uh, butchering I had to do to support multiple hosts, per, uh, sorry, multiple libraries per host, the packaging I did was really quite simple. When I made the release, the entire Koha com community uh, showed extreme appreciation of this because it saved them huge amounts of work. Even though I could basically, if I had known what I'm doing from the, be the beginning, made all this packaging in just a few days. And if I never ever touched them again, uh, uh, the packaging again, it would still be, be an excellent thing for, for Koha users. Even at just a small package, simple package helps people. My packaging is in fact so simple that the Koha doesn't work out of the box. You have to run uh, a couple of more commands in order to do uh, Apache setup and something else. The reason for this is that I didn't want to make a package that goes and modifies Apache's uh, listen directive. That, uh, if someone did that to me, I would be upset. So I didn't want to do that to them. However, the point of making just simple packages is important. Uh, there had been an earlier attempt at making a Debian package out of Koha. They had decided that Koha has a few hundred different configuration options. All of these need to be supported via DebConf. And ultimately, that's a good thing, I think, uh, at least for some of them. But they had tried to solve the entire problem, and it's a big enough problem that it, uh, it, it, it failed. I went in the other route and, and uh, made something that actually works, even though it's not perfect, and uh, people were happy. One of the things hap that happens when you have an old, crafty project like Koha is that something that was started many, many years ago is that copyright statements and licenses are not always quite up to date. And this also happened with Koha. Koha has files uh, written in 2009 claiming, uh, which have a copyright statement that claims that they were written in 2002 by people who are no longer available in the project. That's because people, upstream people who wanted to start a new file just copied an existing file, removed all the code, and left the copyright statement at, at the top. And that's fair enough because that's what most people do. They start a new thing by, by basing it on something else. Also one of the wonders of free software that you can do that. However, for if one uh, or when one wants to in have Koha included in Debian, these kinds of things should be fixed. Luckily, Koha has been very, very careful about keeping uh, version control system information correct. So all the information is in the version control system, currently in Git. It just needs someone to spend fairly large amount of time to dig out the actual uh, authorship information and so on. It would be nice if there were reliable tools to do this. Anyone here have, uh, who has ever done a copyright review of, of significant amounts of code? Right. Would it be nice to have a tool that deals with this? Good. We agree. I have no idea if such a tool will ever exist. Uh, this slide is a, uh, or picture is uh, from a small town somewhere in New Zealand who has an actual clothing shop called Copyright Clearance. I have no idea why they are called that. Right, don't read this slide, it's too long. So, the thing I would like to suggest that Debian does is to make some kind of checklist or other document that helps an upstream project do things in such a way that the, their project becomes easy to package for, not just for Debian, but also other, dis other distributions. The, uh, well, there are 19 points there that I threw out of, from the top of my head and, and, and by asking a few people. 
it's entirely incomplete. And a JPEG in a slide set somewhere isn't really the best format either. So uh, a wiki page on, on the Debian wiki would probably be a, a, a good, good starting point. I'll be happy to copy and paste these uh, in there if there's interest. Uh, the other thing that I think it would be good for, for Debian to have is something that might be called an upstream front desk. I'm good. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. So uh, one of the reasons uh, there were no Koha Debian packages so far is that the people in the Koha community didn't know how to get uh, the packages done. So they tried to do them themselves. And that's an excellent thing. It's always nice if people do things themselves. But making a good Debian package takes quite a lot of expertise. Unfortunately, even with uh, things like the age and, and uh, DB config common and so on. So it would be nice if uh, there was an easy way to contact a distribution like Debian and, and ask them, we would like to have a package of our software in, uh, for your system. What should we do? Uh, can someone help us? There is a way in Debian for doing this. It's called the uh, RFH bug. And this is slightly inadequate. Very few RFH, requests for help or requests for packages, will get a response at all. I suspect quite a number of people who read Debian Devel kill file all, all, all of those emails. Uh, they could go and talk to Debian Mentor, but that's for people actually making packages and, and trying to learn these things, and it would be most of the time, it would be better if, if there was, for example, a collaboration by someone from Debian who knows to make a package and upstream who, who knows and can change things upstream easily. So yeah, uh, I would now look, like to open the floor for questions if, if Zach has any more. <laughs> and do we have anyone running a microphone? We have someone running a microphone. So, uh, first Zach and then Francois. So, I had three questions. One was, how about an upstream front desk? Okay, none. The second was, uh, how about an um, upstream guide for uh, coming from Debian? So, I think you're ag you agree with this idea. Yeah. And the third, I'm curious about um, your experience with the policy we have in Debian for web applications. So you said um, mixing the DB config stuff and the, w and the WWW policy stuff that you were quite surprised by them. While early on in the lean cycle of squeeze, we had quite some problem with web application policy. We had something like I feel, I think 50 RC bugs filed against web application in general in Debian and they were all legitimate uh, mm -hmm. RC bugs. And we had a brief discussion back then and my impression at the end of the discussion was that we still lack a proper way of automatically enabling web applications as soon in, the, in a way that when you install a package, you get the application running by default unless there are security problems or this kind of stuff. So I just wanted to, if you can comment a, b a little on that. Yeah. Uh, the web application policy or sub-policy that we have in Debian, and you'll notice that I've started speaking we about Debian, uh, is an excellent thing. It's also uh, inadequate. Uh, there are a lot of things there that a maintainer still has to do and decide for themselves. So it's a good start, and uh, Debian needs to be applauded for, for making, uh, making uh, this part progress. But there's a lot of things that need to be done uh, still to make this an easy thing. One of the problems here is that, for example, Koha uh, depends on a few things that really require Apache. And it would be nice if, if you didn't have to specifically uh, require Apache, but there was generic ways of doing things like uh, rewrites or, or uh, virtual hosts and, and so on. So instead of providing an Apache virtual host specification, you provide something more higher level and, and generate 
automatically for whatever web server you happen to have. So um, I, I actually really like that list, and uh, w one of the things I was just thinking about is that it would be nice to have this sort of uh, checklist or, or sort of upstream <coughs> questionnaire and, and like put a score for, for upstream. You know, like Koha is a, a, a 19 out of 20 uh, upstream and, you know, little like star or whatever um, on the PTS or, or something yeah. like that um, to, to, to sort of encourage, uh, I mean, th there's the idea of having basically a manual for, the, which is what you said, right? Like to, to guidelines to, to be a good upstream generally, but specifically to Debian. Um, but also, I think maybe doing it in a fun way, like having a score and, and w would, would encourage upstreams that are currently, you know, three out of 20 to, to do a couple of those things that, that would make life easier for, for Debian and all other people, really. So yeah, I like that idea. Uh, now we just need someone to implement. Hi. So, w so one of the things you talked about was the difficulty of being able to configure Koha for installation in a manner that allowed for virtual hosting of the web application. Yeah. Um, now that you've gone through that experience, are there are there design patterns when creating the upstream source that would facilitate this that you could help document so that we can encourage other upstreams to follow suit? Um, I don't think that's on your uh, checklist up uh, up here. True. Um, but it is a very very difficult problem to get right and voices of experience in that in that area are are going to be very helpful um, and I, I don't know if the web um, the web package web app policy addresses this at all because I'm afraid I haven't looked at that lately um, but if it doesn't maybe that's also somewhere we should include that kind of information yeah uh, unfortunately I am still entirely ignorant of good ways of making web applications uh, I think one of the key things here would be that the application should be written in such a way that it can be given a base URL, and ev every everything it needs to reference is relative to that. And the base URL shouldn't assume, our application shouldn't assume that the base URL is at the top of a domain either. Uh, Joey, I'm sure, has a lot of experience of, of the URL mangling you will have to do with to get this working and a number of other people can uh, also help with this discussion but yes totally that's something that upstream needs design patterns for web application authors like every other software developer tend to think that their application is the most important in the world i'm no exception and i'm constantly amazed that not everyone thinks i'm the most important person in the world Mm, yes, I am. <laughs> <laughs> However, one of the things that this ways in this uh, in which this manifest is that they assume that they can get an entire domain. Having an entire domain makes things simpler to implement, at least a little bit simpler to implement. But uh, it's also a, uh, makes thi uh, makes life worse for people who just want to try the program or, or who don't have the ability to add more domains for, for whatever purpose. Uh, I've had extensive experience in um, virtualized uh, applications. Um, I used to work for Alfresco and before that worked for Interwoven. We did a lot of stuff dealing with that. Um, if anyone wants to talk to me about that, I'm happy to have a decide discussion. Uh, one thing that's another interesting concern is if you wish to bookmark the state that you're in in a virtualized environment, there's a very cute trick, and I can happy to discuss that as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm John Cox, J O N C O X. Thanks, Dad. Other questions? Just another comment here regarding this particular upstream. Um, it came as a surprise to me to learn that Koha was not yet packaged, given that I have been reading for a number of years quite extensive commentary on Koha on Planet Debian from a Debian developer. Um, I wonder if you have any insights regarding that that you are interested in sharing. 
I think the uh, what happened, I came, I hadn't heard of Koha before January, and I didn't touch it before March. So I don't know much, uh, most of the history, but my impression is that uh, the earlier Debian packaging attempt tried to be too uh, ambitious, and people ran out of time for, for making that happen. Since I'm very lazy, I did it the simple way, and then it uh, got far enough that people got a lot of use out of that. The Koha packaging is, uh, I don't maintain that anymore. I uh, turned it over to someone uh, who works for Catalyst, and, and they're now taking care of that. Before I uh, left Catalyst, I gave them an internal uh, half-day tutorial session on, on, on making Debian packages, and that was also quite quite popular, and at least two people unknowingly to each other have told me since that they now view the entire world as something to package. <laughs> Every time they have even a simple little script that they might ever want to use again, they want to make a package out of that. And one of the, uh, I want to praise Joey again, one of the reasons why this is so is because VH7 makes it so easy to make packages. I have given such a packaging tutorials before. Sometimes the people have been asking for me for weeks to give, it, uh, give one, and then I never hear of them making a single package again because I was doing this entirely, back then I was doing it entirely without dev helper. And for some reason people find writing 50 line make files more work to write than copy and pasting a, a three line one. Then again, that brings another issue that upstream often does wrong from a Debian point of view. The build system and configuration system for, for build time configuration tends to either be archaic, highly manual, or um, require excessive attention from the packager. Again, it would be nice if there was a very small amount of build systems out there. I'm not going to be saying how many, but <laughs> smaller is better. Uh, Perl is one of the uh, universes where, where it's fairly nice because there's three popular ones, two popular ones, makefile.pl and, and something else. And uh, Python has a couple of sort of standard ones, and, and C programs have GNU Auto tools. As much as I don't like the GNU Auto tools, they do make packaging life easier most of the time. And one of the things I would like to see before I quit computing is someone who turns out to be the world's best build system engineer and solves this problem once and for all so that nobody else ever have to worry about it and solves it in such a way that upstream also doesn't need to worry about that. Auto, auto tools tends to require upstream to write too much code. Likewise, uh, some of the, the other alternatives I know about. It would be nice if there was this group of people who concentrate on, on making sure that nobody else needs to write more than one command in order to configure, build, and, and, and install uh, any kind of application. I know that's somewhat unlikely, so I'll be, I'll be willing to settle for slightly more different kinds of build systems. Any other questions? Over there. So, when are you officially going to rejoin Debian? That's off topic for this talk. <laughs> <laughs> if my hotel internet works, I might do it tonight. tonight. Otherwise, I will do it from the country without internet called New Zealand sometime next week. <laughs> Any on topic questions? In that case, I thank you.
boring slides don't create.